Thank you for joining us to watch the documentary, St. Joseph Cathedral. Hello, I'm Bishop Richard Malone. Did you know that all Catholic dioceses across the world have a cathedral? It's the chief church of each diocese, the bishop's parish, and home to all Catholics. I invite you to come for mass, come to pray, come to be inspired. Everyone is always welcome at St. Joseph Cathedral. The cathedral is the center of a diocese, the parish from which all other parishes take their unity. St. Joseph Cathedral was created by the vision of Buffalo's first bishop, the Right Reverend John Tymon. This building is a glorious building physically. It has tremendous historical roots for the family of God in Western New York. The spirit of who we are as the people of God really comes to its full flowering in a celebration here or even a visit because you're part, part and parcel of this place. In 1847, Pope Pius IX separated the Diocese of New York, which had included the whole state, into three dioceses, the Archdiocese of New York, the Diocese of Albany, and the Diocese of Buffalo. Needing a shepherd for the new Buffalo Diocese, His Holiness appointed John Tymon as the first Bishop of Buffalo. Bishop Tymon's experience as a missionary in the untamed West prepared him for the challenge of establishing the new diocese. The Catholic population was a minority group, mostly from the poor laboring class. The city of Buffalo was in its infancy, having been incorporated for only 15 years. Even though the construction of the Erie Canal, railroads, and grain elevators was just beginning to have an effect on the city, the new bishop saw the potential and envisioned a bright future for Buffalo, one that would include a brilliant cathedral. Every, every bishop needs a place where he can officially put his chair, uh, where he speaks from when he talks to his people and teaches them. And of course, that's what gives the cathedral its title, because chair in Latin is cathedra. And so the place where that chair is, officially, is his cathedral. Almost immediately, he thought in terms of building such a place. And while he was present to the diocese, he took an option on some land over on the site of what now is St. Michael's Church, over on Washington Street. But of course, in order to build such a structure, uh, he had to have money. Bishop Timon traveled to Rome in 1849 to give his personal report to the Holy Father on the development of the new diocese. During his visit, Pope Pius IX initiated fundraising for the cathedral with a sizable donation of $2,000. He also made the suggestion that the diocese be dedicated to St. Joseph, patron of the worker. Bishop Tymon met with many influential people in Europe to petition for the substantial gifts he would need to complete the cathedral. One of these meetings was with King Ludwig of Bavaria. The king had a passion for stained glass windows and had commissioned three windows depicting the incarnation, redemption, and resurrection to be displayed at the Munich Exposition of 1850. Bishop Tymon saw these windows and decided that they would be perfect for his new cathedral. 
he proceeded to ask the king for his windows. And after initially laughing at Bishop Timon, voila, there you see them behind me. He must have been a very convincing bishop. In 1850, Bishop Timon delivered a formal announcement to the clergy and laity of the Diocese of Buffalo concerning his intent to build a cathedral. Assenting to the wishes and yielding to the judgment of those whom we love and venerate, we will, in God's name, begin to build the Cathedral Church of St. Joseph as grateful monument in honor of our Savior God as gate of heaven for many a sad pilgrim of earth, as diocesan center of unity for this portion of the flock of Christ. He put out the word to his priests. He made collections within the diocese, but he also made these, these journeys even to what we now know as Mexico. Uh, Texas at the time, that was his original missionary territory. So he went down to his old congregation and passed the hat there, so to speak. While Bishop Timon was away, his vicar general, Father O'Reilly, was given charge to tend to the daily needs of the diocese. In the bishop's absence, Father O'Reilly made the bold decision to purchase the property known as the Webster Gardens Estate at Franklin and Swan Streets for $27,000. When Bishop Timon returned, he was disturbed that this decision had been made without his knowledge, but when he saw the property, he was convinced that Father O'Reilly had made the right decision. This was to be the location of his cathedral. The next step was to select an architect. Bishop Timon chose Patrick C. Keeley from Brooklyn, who was well known for his Gothic designs. There were a number of churches in the Northeast that Patrick Keeley was responsible for. Um, they have this neo-Gothic structure, that is, it's a building that has lots of windows in it. It's very light and airy, and it, it kind of rises uh, to the heights of heaven, which again, in itself, is a prayer. In fact, we often say, prayer is the raising of the mind and heart to Almighty God. So a Gothic cathedral, by the very sense of what it is, helps people to pray. Ground was broken for the cathedral on February 2nd, 1851. Bishop Timon asked his priests and people of the diocese for support. Though many had little to give financially, their physical contributions of hauling stone and masonry work were abundant. It has been said that the walls of the cathedral rose because of the sweat and fortitude of Buffalo's faithful. I had a, a relative by the name of, or an ancestor by the name of John Oakes, who had a farm out in what's now Northbush or Kenmore Avenue. But John Oakes used to bring his horse and wagon down to the site of the canal and haul stone up, because the stone for this building was quarried down in Lockport. And so they would put it on the canal boats, bring it up to Buffalo, offload it, and then people like my great-great-grandfather would haul it up to the site of the cathedral. The building was completed and the dedication was held in 1855. The dedication allowed the cathedral to be formally used as a place of worship. The total cost was $180,000, and with Bishop Timon's financial successes in Europe and abroad, the building was clear of debt and able to be consecrated as a permanent place of worship on August 30th 1863. Bishop Timon served his diocese faithfully for 20 years. On April 16, 1867, he passed to his great reward and was laid to rest beneath the sanctuary. Thousands of people came to pay their respects to this man of God. With the passing of Bishop Timon, the diocese was in need of a new shepherd. In 1868, Stephen Vincent Ryan was appointed second bishop of Buffalo by Pope Pius IX. In 1872, at Ryan's request, a chapel was added to the cathedral. This chapel of ease, so named by Bishop Ryan, 
allowed him to celebrate Mass privately when no formal celebration was scheduled for the cathedral. Today, the chapel is dedicated to Our Lady and is an important part of daily worship. Bishop Ryan lived on the cathedral's property until 1889. Due to ailing health, he sought a quieter section of the city. He moved to a residence on Delaware Avenue just north of West Utica Street. He was called to his eternal home on April 10, 1896, and as requested, was buried in the cathedral beside Bishop Tymon. In the next year, James Edward Quigley became the third bishop of Buffalo. By the 1900s, Buffalo was the eighth largest city in the United States. The downtown area had become a center for shipping and manufacturing. This had a positive effect on the prosperity of the city, but because of soot and noise pollution, the area was no longer suitable for residential population. Bishop Quigley found the living conditions to be unbearable and moved his residence from the rectory of the cathedral. He chose to occupy Bishop Ryan's former dwelling at Delaware Avenue and West Utica Street. In 1903, Bishop Quigley was appointed Archbishop of Chicago, and Charles H. Colton was appointed fourth Bishop of Buffalo. As rector, Father Biden was responsible for the first large-scale renovation which took place between 1903 and 1905 in preparation for the Golden Jubilee year. The renovation included painting, new flooring, new pews, the installation of new electric lighting, and beautiful shrine altars. In 1912, due to the continued decline in the environment of the downtown area, Bishop Colton announced his plan for a new St. Joseph Cathedral. He chose to follow the migration that Bishop Ryan and Bishop Quigley had begun and built on the corner of Delaware Avenue in West Utica. From that point on, the original cathedral became known as St. Joseph Old Cathedral and served as the Episcopal seat for the diocese until December 6, 1915, when St. Joseph New Cathedral was formally consecrated. Bishop Colton did not live to take the chair in his new cathedral. He died May 9, 1915. The first celebration held there was his funeral. He was laid to rest in the cathedral that he built. St. Joseph Old Cathedral carried on to serve its parishioners continuously throughout the next 60 years. During this time, all major events of the diocese took place at the new cathedral. There were problems with the design of the new cathedral. Structural maintenance was needed on a continual basis. In 1973, Edward D. Head was appointed 11th Bishop of Buffalo. As bishop, the difficulties associated with the new cathedral were now his responsibility. First Christmas, I acted as his master of ceremonies in St. Joseph's New Cathedral. Now we're walking down the center aisle and there is a huge puddle of water that we had to walk around. And we used to laugh about it, but the rector of the cathedral was a beloved man, Monsignor Garvey. But he didn't want the bishop to know how bad conditions were in the cathedral. But we saw the water. We had to walk around the water on Christmas Eve. He appointed me chairman of a committee to study St. Joseph's New Cathedral, where Time and Towers presently is and we assembled architects and engineers, contractors to study the condition of St. Joseph New Cathedral on Delaware Avenue. And then we had a meeting with the bishop to give our final report. I think the price tag for the repair was like four and a half million dollars. And that was acceptable, but the bishop asked a telling question. 
He turned to the engineers and the contract. He said, all right, if we spend $4.5 million, will you guarantee me that the walls, the ceiling will not leak anymore? And there was dead silence in the room. And the bishop turned to me and said, the decision is made, we take it down. On May 30th, 1977, the cathedral on Franklin Street was rededicated and the bishop's chair, the cathedra, was moved back downtown. As the new cathedral was to be raised, it became necessary to move Bishop Colton's body. Ironically, his final resting place became the same cathedral he had left behind. Many embellishments from the new cathedral were incorporated into the old cathedral. The cross outside was actually uh, mounted on the cathedral, the new cathedral. And of course, when they were looking to uh, restructure this area here, then they, what they did is they uh, uh, took with that cross and made it kind of central. So we always put flowers around it. And kind of it draws the two sites together. The windows in the chapel came from the uh, new cathedral. Uh, we had very plain glass windows, and so before it was dismantled, they took those particular windows, and they make a great addition because it really speaks of um, the passion of Christ, the road to Calvary, meeting the women, the instruments of his torture, etc. They're very, very effective places, especially when we use the chapel for the masses on a daily basis. Bishop Head retired from his post on April 18, 1995, and Henry J. Mansell was appointed 12th Bishop of Buffalo on June 12th of the same year. Bishop Mansell refreshed the vision of Bishop Timon with a full renovation. And I almost call him the second founder of the cathedral is, is uh, Bishop Henry J. Menzel, because he was the one that, uh, although Bishop Head had done much to reconstruct it as they brought it back, but again, uh, that whole attempt to incorporate changes in terms of the kind of style that existed here was really, the, was driven by Bishop Menzel's projection of what he thought the cathedral should look like. It had really um, not been given much attention from 1915 to 1977, so it needed to be restored. Um, it hadn't received that much attention. Uh, there was a great deal of work that needed to be done, uh, both in terms of the, the visible structure and in terms of the infrastructure. You know, we did a fair amount of plumbing and electrical work, and then, of course, the sound system. But the, uh, the lines are so beautiful, the, the, the fidelity to Gothic architecture is so strong. The ribs vaulting in the ceilings, for example, uh, you couldn't even see the medallions, you couldn't make out the emblems that were up there until we had it all cleaned and painted and uh, highlighted, and the um, gold leaf and the gold um, paint. All of that brought out what was the original beauty of St. Joseph's Cathedral, enhanced it, and brought it then into uh, uh, concert compliance, if you will, with the liturgical developments of the 20th century. And then, of course, uh, we had to do the, um, the choir loft and with the organ, which is this fantastic hook and Hastings organ going back to the Centennial Exhibition in 1876 in Philadelphia. Um, Bishop Ryan was able to purchase that for $30,000, I believe. It's incredible. It's a, it's a magnificent instrument. And, but it had difficulties in the winter time, and uh, it really hadn't been touched in any significant way since the 1920s. So that needed massive restoration. But it was such a valuable instrument, and it's even more valuable now, of course, that we had to make the investment we did. It, it, it was over a million dollars, thanks to the generosity of so many people here in Western New York that we were able to do that. And it's been re redesigned et cetera, over a period of years, the last of which when every smidgen of this organ was removed from this choir loft and taken to Massachusetts, the Andover Organ Company, and rebuilt down there so that they could make their adjustments, add to it, et cetera. Again, dismantled, put it on trucks, haul it back here, and reestablished it. Quite a project, though. 
The St. Joe's organ is really one of the most historic organs in the country. When it was built in 1876 for our nation's centennial, it was immediately called the Dictionary of American Organs because it represented the very best of American sounds of the 19th century. So right now it has over 5,000 pipes. There was a significant renovation in 2000, 2001, and it's even more glorious than ever. The sounds are marvelous, they're historic, and soft and sensitive and loud and magnificent. It has the entire range. The magnificence of the organ and its significant role as part of the liturgy mirrors the function of the cathedral as the center of worship. Uh, the cathedral is um, the place where the bishop exercises really his office as a liturgical leader, spiritual leader, uh, educational leader. This is the place from which formally all that kind of instruction needs to radiate out to the other parishes and other priests, his assistants. He sets the standard for the diocese. Of course, the priests look to him for the kind of example they need for liturgical celebrations. This is where men are ordained here in this cathedral. This is where priesthood goes on, the diaconate goes on. Uh, the celebrations of the diocese go on from here. But that's the, it's because it's the center. It's the center of what we do as Catholics and Christians in this area, these eight counties called the Diocese of Buffalo, the Church of Buffalo. In 2004, Bishop Mansell went on to become Archbishop of Hartford. Needing a new pastor for this diocese, Pope John Paul II appointed Edward U. Kimmick, 13th Bishop of Buffalo. He was installed on October 28, 2004. Well, first of all, I saw the outside. It's a beautiful, gorgeous Gothic church. Then I went inside. You almost ooh and odd. Ah, it's beautiful. It is a beautiful cathedral. I went up to the sanctuary and I took a look at the chair where where the uh, bishop sits. It's the cathedra, which is the Latin word for the chair, and then why we have the name cathedral. So I looked and I. It was kind to of say, well, from now on, I have to sit here and, and uh, we'll try to serve and lead the diocese, to be a servant leader of the diocese. During Bishop Kimmick's first year, he led the diocese in saying a sad farewell to one of its beloved shepherds, the Most Reverend Edward D. Head. Bishop Head went on to his great reward on March 29, 2005. During the same week, the world mourned the death of Pope John Paul II. As the center of worship for this diocese, masses were held at the cathedral for both of these men of God. Bishop Head had expressed his desire to be laid to rest in the diocese where he had served for over 30 years. It is the choice of a bishop to be buried in his church. The interment of a bishop in his cathedral allows for the continued connection between the people of the diocese and their shepherd. On April 4, 2005, his body was buried in the crypt area of the cathedral behind the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. The crypt area of the cathedral is actually made for eight burials. There are four there now, Bishop Timon, followed by Bishop Stephen Vincent Ryan, then the fourth Bishop of Buffalo, Charles Henry Colton, and lastly, Bishop Edward Head. In 2012, Pope Benedict XVI named Bishop Richard J. Malone 14th Bishop of Buffalo. And on August 10th, Bishop Malone was installed at St. Joseph Cathedral. Seeing the cathedral jam-packed with God's people, my thought was these now are the people entrusted to my pastoral care by the Lord. 
and I know I need the Lord's help and his leadership to do this work well. But to walk up the aisle and see all of these smiling, enthusiastic, welcoming faces was something I will never forget. The beauty that you see physically before you and in communion with that, you can't help in the Gothic and in anything that's beautiful to be lifted to the source of all beauty and good and truth. As St. Peter tells us in his first epistle, chapter 2, that with all of this, with all the stones, with everything else, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Everybody has his or her parish, but the cathedral belongs to everybody. So that technically speaking, uh, any Catholic in the Diocese of Buffalo can be baptized in the cathedral, can be married in the cathedral, can be buried from the cathedral. Now, we couldn't have 700,000 people coming next week, but it belongs to everybody. It's the seat of the bishop, it's the center of the diocese. I welcome all in the diocese, whether those who live here or those who are visiting here, that they would take an opportunity, take the opportunity to come to this house of prayer and to, to be able to touch in a particular way the, the history of our diocese and the deep faith that is here too. Every cathedral, the bishop's own church, is really the mother church of the diocese. So St. Joseph's Cathedral is our mother church here in Western New York. And it's a church that's open to every Catholic, in fact, everybody from Western New York. And the wonderful thing about the cathedral is its beauty reminds us of the beauty of the Catholic community and our heritage here. Its stability reminds us of all that the church has been through and not only survives it, but thrives. And one interesting point people don't often think of is that the cathedral is unfinished. There's one missing tower. And I think that's a reminder to us that the church itself, our community of faith, is always a work in progress. We're always building to become what the Lord calls us to be. The glory of this place needs always to be reflected in the soul and the spirit of each of us. And that spirit, as we leave this place, needs to go forward from St. Joseph's Cathedral to the world at large. Oh. 